The Nigerian Bar Association elected 38 president and other national officers. We have details of that and some early reactions trailing the polls. On our interview segment, we chat with a former president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, Buma Ayomide Alabi. That's our lineup on this episode of the program. Hello and welcome. I'm Shola Sheeli. Now, it's no longer news that the elections of the Nigerian Bar Association has been won and lost. We'll bring you a recap of how that went down. But let's kick off the program with our conversation with a former president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. Buma Ayomide Alabi was the first woman president in the over 50-year history of the Association of Lawyers from 54 countries. She has over 30 years' experience in corporate commercial practice and is passionate about judicial reforms as well as replicating global standards here in Nigeria. Here's our chat. I want to start with the NBA 2020 elections. First, did you vote? Of course, I had to vote. I mean, this is our elections and it's important we participate in the process. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to do so and one must do their civic duty. So yes, I did vote. Okay, so tell us about it. How long did it take? What was the process like? Well, I, I was quite puzzled that we had to be re-verified because I voted in the last uh, elections as well and that was electronic. So once you're ready on the system, why are we having to be re-verified as uh, you know, lawyers again? That I found a bit puzzling. It means that there was some sort of lack of continuity between the previous one, and there should be. Um, yes, obviously we have to show that we have a current practicing certificate as well as our current, um, that we've paid our dues. And that was all done before we got onto the list. Um, so I thought the, the process was a bit cumbersome. It could be easier. Certainly, if you've been verified previously, we shouldn't have to do it every time we have an election. There should be some continuity. But the actual process of voting for the election, how long did that take? Well, was that, that was pretty straightforward. Okay. I got an email. I clicked on the link. It took me straight to the point for voting. Oh, yeah, by the way, the email came from an unknown uh, source. So it wasn't an MBA source. And initially, I was a bit... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? I was a bit suspicious because you don't just want to click on anything. But it was on the right day. It said vote for the MBA and therefore I clicked. It took me on to give the various candidates and I made my choices. Now we're electing a new NBA president and a new leadership at a time of uh, the global pandemic, uh, a time of the new normal remote proceedings and all. Drawing from global trends and best practices, what skills would you say that the Nigerian lawyers need for managing their practice and generally for thriving in a coronavirus environment? The same skills that we've always required, which I think the pandemic in this jurisdiction is bringing to the fore, which is great. That is, we, you know, you can't do without technology today. You have to be digital. You have to be able to use emails, use the tools, the usual working tools that we all used to, PDF documents. These most basic things that everyone else is using in most of the Commonwealth jurisdictions. A lot of our colleagues here are still finding it difficult to, to, you know, to adapt. So in that sense, the pandemic has given us a silver lining because they're all being forced to use what for me are basic work tools and should be for every lawyer. And the MBA as well, fortunately, had already started in that uh, process of going more electronic, more digital, and it can only continue in that direction. So what, what are the lessons that lawyers for you, what lessons should law lawyers learn from this pandemic? Lawyers from this should learn to be multidisciplinary um, and proactive. So, for instance, once the pandemic started and it was clear that this was going to be a global issue, we looked at it and said, okay, how do we assist our clients through this process? So we practically reached out to them with some information and advice, all the uh, contacts within our database. That's meant that we've kept pretty busy despite the courts not being in session because we're advising on the impact industrial relations, 
all sorts of it's impacted on business in all sorts of ways and um, they need our advice so we need to be proactive we need to learn to keep a database we need to learn to keep contact details of our clients you know so that we can communicate with them electronically i know this is for us is commonplace but for a lot of my colleagues it apparently isn't and i hope that's the one thing that comes out of the pandemic for the for this jurisdiction because it'd be good for the clients it'd be good for all of us let's talk about agenda setting for the new leadership of the bar what for you are if you were to pick the three top things that you know this leadership should be focusing on what should it what would those things be three top things one is the when we talk about welfare of the younger lawyers I don't actually like the word welfare because it implies that we're giving them some sort of palliative or something. Or that's not what, out. yes, that's not my, you know, so that's not quite what I mean. But I want to see a situation where when young lawyers come into the profession, they're treated fairly, they're adequately rewarded, they're protected from sexual harassment, you know, they're protected from exploitation by seniors. Yes, you have some young lawyers who are not serious, but if you're the employer, you have the choice. If they're not serious and you've provided them with all they need to do a proper job, you can let them go. But give them a level playing field and the profession has to intervene. Oh. Set a minimum wage. That's what happens in other jurisdictions. Yes, take into consideration the fact that different parts of the country have different sorts of practices and different levels of income. So I practiced in London for many years. London waiting meant that solicitors or trainees who were being trained in London were paid more than those who were being trained in, say, for instance, Bournemouth or, or Wales, because you earn less in Cardiff, your um, outgoings are less than if you were in London. That can be applied here. So if you're in Lagos, you can expect to be paid more than if you're in uh, Damatru, for instance, or in Oweri. It's not rocket science. We owe it to the young people coming into this profession to treat them with dignity, to teach them, and to pay them well whilst they're doing so. They, of course, owe us a duty when given the opportunity to work hard, to upskill, because once you have a wig and a gown, you are a professional. Don't come into a firm and think I'm still a student. Number two is access to justice. Um, because you see, the fact that justice is so delayed in this jurisdiction is impacting on confidence in the system. And the less confidence the litigating public have in the system, the less likely they, they are to use it which means fewer clients for all of us. And ultimately, people taking the law into their hands, self-help, because they have no confidence in the system. And it has got to that point. If I'm waiting six years, four years, seven years, to get a matter concluded, then clearly um, something is very, very wrong. And the Nigerian Bar Association has a duty which that duty is on the leadership of the bar to engage with the system, all stakeholders, to ensure that this changes. I don't see why we're still, for instance, appealing interlocutory matters all the way to the Supreme Court. It's a waste of time. The third thing is to have a proper directory of lawyers and ensure that you know, standards are met, a minimum standard in terms of practice. And if they're not, then those who are infringing or not meeting those standards are speedily dealt with. Again, it's about confidence because that will build confidence in the profession. And um, it's, you know, so if... if so you're say, saying standards, are you talking about ethics? Ethics. Okay. Ethical standards. Okay professional standards we have a you know we we're, we're called a noble profession a learned profession for a reason and we have to meet a minimum standard in the way we interact with each other and the way we interact with our clients and 
you know, for me, the, it has to be a priority of the leadership of the bar. So lead by example and also make it easy for those who consume the services that we provide to hold us accountable for the services or the, for the um, breach of our con uh, ethical standards in the way we interact with them. In the weeks leading to the elections, I had conversations with all the presidential candidates. And one of the issues that came to the fore was that the, the bar has lost its respect. You know, even among members of the public, um, before when a lawyer gets into a space, you know, there's that respect, there's a lawyer, a learned person is here. But we've lost, according to a lot of them, according to most of the candidates, the bar has lost that respect. What do you think that the leadership, the new leadership of the bar can do to regain public respect and trust? Also in the well, um, you know what? Yes, the bar has lost its respect. The bar is to blame entirely because guess what we do in this transition, which is totally unacceptable. And the leadership of the Nigerian Bar Association can put a stop to it. Lawyers are litigating their cases in the public space, on the pages of newspapers in places, forums like yours, you know, fora like yours, I beg your pardon. And it's entirely wrong. You cannot come out there and continue to comment on matters that are subjudices, and they know how they, we, we've seen them do it constantly. They will imply and in, make inferences on the, um, how do you say, the, the integrity of judges, because matters have not gone their way. It's totally unacceptable leadership of the bar has to take um, steps to ensure that these things stop. Another issue that some lawyers are worried about is the propriety of the Nigerian courts going on vacation at this time. I think a lot of people felt that it was some sort of forced holiday when the pandemic came and you know there was restrictions and the courts were not open. But then to now go on vacation when life is gradually returning so almost normal. Some people have issues with that. What do you think? Um, in fairness, I mean, the pandem pandemic happened and no one was expecting it. But if you recall how overworked our judges are in any case, in most parts of this jurisdiction, certainly in Lagos, Port Harcourt, Abuja, and most of the cities, you would find that even though the courts were not sitting, they were writing judgments, they were writing rulings, they were effectively working in, in, in that period. They were taking urgent applications, and therefore, they are entitled to their vacation. You know, if they do not take the vacation at the appropriate time, then when will they take it? So you have to think beyond just this next six months. Are you going to ask the judges to work right through from now until next vacation? And would that be fair you know, on, on them? I don't think so. So I, don't, I think it's fair that they take their vacation. The normal uh, state of play um, applies. So there are vacation judges. If there's anything urgent, they'll be dealt with. And in the, in the interim, the new rules are coming into play on virtual court seatings and so on. So that by the time we do start in September or October, those new rules, they've had a chance to look at them and begin to implement. So it's interesting that you've touched on virtual court proceedings. And one of the things that came to the fore, I think, was when I covered the, the first Lagos virtual court sitting, was that issues of funding for the judiciary, um, electricity, power, um, internet connectivity, and all of that, that some lawyers have identified as stumbling blocks to the effectiveness of uh, virtual court sittings. How do you think that we can tackle that, considering the fact that in the budget, the funding for the judiciary continues to decrease? What's the way around that and what's the role of the NDA in, I don't know, maybe asking for more funding for the judges? So I've been consistent in advocating for additional funding for the judiciary. I think the funding for the judiciary is woefully inadequate. And you can't pay the price of a care and get a Rolls Royce. I'm sorry. So if we want a Rolls Royce, we have to pay for it. 
And um, this is an opportunity because we need to put in place the infrastructure to enable the courts deliver virtually and in so doing ensure that our people get justice in their commercial matters, get on with their lives if it's to do with their domestic affairs, divorces, custody of children, if they're in, awaiting trial for, for criminal proceedings. All of these things impact on the everyday life of everyday people. So the courts, the judiciary is, in my, to my mind, the most important arm of government out of the three for the ordinary person. And therefore, it should be adequately funded in order to deliver justice in time for the Nigerian public. And it is not the role of the judges to go cap in hand or stand on the streets or to advocate for funding. That's the role of the Nigerian Bar Association. That's the role of the bar. We are the voice of the bench. And the president of the Nigerian Bar Association should make it a priority to advocate for proper funding for the judiciary and knock on every door, bang down the door if need be, until we get what we want, what we know is right for the society. Almost 29,000 lawyers were verified to vote, but slightly over 18,000 took part in the elections, which held from 11 p.m. of Wednesday the 29th of July to 11 p.m. of Thursday the 30th at the end of which emerged a president-elect and other national officers who will steer the ship of the Nigerian Bar Association for the next two years. Three senior lawyers from the western zone of the country jostled to replace the outgoing president of the bar, Mr. Paul Usoro. Focusing on key issues affecting the bar and their colleagues, they sold themselves. On Wednesday, the 29th of July, it was decision time. At about 5.30 p.m. of the same day, the Electoral Committee of the NBA released the final list of eligible voters. A look at the list shows that 29,635 legal practitioners had been verified and duly accredited to vote after having fulfilled all necessary requirements. Criticism immediately trailed the release of that list, with some legal practitioners alleging that he had been parted, while some other qualified and verified names had been deleted. There are also branches that have been captured in that list as International Diaspora Branch, with 87 members who we don't even believe are lawyers. What is International Diaspora Branch in NBA? And then you go to branches like... Uh, Uromi branch, where the numbers of their members were cut down. If you go to Ishoko branch in Rivers, the number of their verified and qualified voters were cut down. Then you go to uh, Aba branch, they are adding names of people from Southwest. You know, so go across. We know people personally. Friends that we know did not pay practicing fee or branch due within time. Their names are in the list. People we know personally that didn't pay. Their names are in the list. How comes? So this, this is the height of incompetence. It is not incompetence, in fact. This is the height of rigging. It is deliberate. When these complaints were brought to the notice of the Electoral Committee, the response was that it would be addressed. The elections, which were conducted via electronic means, went on as scheduled at 11 p.m. Wednesday night, and many lawyers were happy that they could observe the results in real time from the election portal. The former chairman of the NBA's section on business law, Olumide Akpata, took an early lead in the polls, one he held on to till the polls closed 24 hours later. Akwata scored 9,891 votes out of a total of 18,256 voters who participated in the elections, representing 54.3% of the votes. He defeated Dr. Babatunde Ajibade SAN, who scored 4,328 votes, and Dele Adeshino SAN, who scored 3,982. The electoral chairman officially announced the results at about midnight of the 31st of July. 
I, Kao Elja Tawo, the Chairman Electoral Committee of the Nigerian Bar Association, ECNBA, as the Electoral Officer for the 2020 National Officers' Elections, hereby declare that Akpata Olumide Anthony, having scored the highest number of votes cast and satisfying the provisions of the Constitution of the NBA 2015, as amended as the winner of the election into the office of the president of the Nigerian Bar Association. From there, it was jubilation for the winning candidate and his supporters. It has been a long journey coming to this point, and um, but I'm 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 grateful. I'm I'm, I'm but I'm also um, energized. I'm energized for for the work that must be done, the work that is ahead of us, the total revamping of the bar of the legal profession. Uh, I run my campaign under the uh, a slogan making the bar work for all. And I meant every word of it. I intend to make the bar work for all of its members and I intend to make the bar work for society. Before the official declaration of results, however, another candidate, Daily Additional SAN, asked the Electoral Committee to cancel the elections, saying it was fraught with irregularities. In a letter to the Electoral Chairman, Mr. Tao Tao SAN, dated 30 July 2020 and personally signed by him, Mr. Additional stated that the voters' list contained grave errors of omission and commission. Some errors he pointed out includes inflation of the list of some NBA branches, names of lawyers under the subheading International Diaspora, in clear violation of the provisions of the NBA Constitution, and the deletion of names of some lawyers from the final list. He asked the electoral body to cancel what he calls this sham election, and went on to say that if the process is bad, the products cannot be good. But here's how the president-elect reacted to that call. I hope, I hope that uh, we will all uh, accept this outcome and proceed to um, make the bar a much better organization, the NBA a much better organization. However, uh, uh, as you say, I have heard that uh, of complaints in certain quarters. I am not oblivious of those complaints or the events that led to those complaints. I'm not oblivious of them. But so anybody who feels um, uh, that they need to uh, pursue the matter further, I'm sure they know what to do. The other candidate, Babatunde Ajibade SAN, took a different approach. He called the president-elect to congratulate him on his election as the 30th president of the association. He noted that as a co-contestant in the elections, he was proud of the level of the debate and the quality of the ideas that were brought forth for the improvement of the association, the welfare of its members, and the good of the society. He, however, described as unfortunate the process leading up to and during the election, which he says were not devoid of controversy. In his words, it's my fervent hope that we will get over these repeated challenges with conducting objectively free and fair elections into the leadership positions in the association. He also asked the incoming president and his executive to take deliberate and proactive steps to unite the bar. In another statement he released after the declaration of results, Mr. Dele Adeshina says that it was the association and not him or his supporters that lost the recently concluded elections. Whether or not the NBA has lost the last opportunity to reinvent itself, he says only time will tell. The new officers of the association are expected to be sworn in at the forthcoming 60th Annual General Conference of the NBA, holding virtually from the 26th to the 29th of August. In other news, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court of Nigeria, Justice John Soho, has issued new practice directions for all 36 divisions of the court in relation to pre-election cases. 
A statement released by the court's acting information officer, Obi Nwandu, says the practice directions were made in the exercise of the powers conferred on the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court of Nigeria by Section 254 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, as amended. The practice directions number 2, 2020, which takes effect from the commencement date of the court's vacation, Friday, the 24th of July, will also apply during the two month vacation. The same Federal High Court in Lagos has refused to grant bail to 10 alleged pirates accused of hijacking a fishing vessel, FV Hailu Feng 2, belonging to Haina Fishing Company. Justice Ayakunle Faji denied them bail on account of the gravity of the charge against them, a charge with borders on threat to national security. He also considered the punishments for the alleged crimes, which stipulates a life sentence or at least a fine of not less than 50 million and restitution if found guilty under the Suppression of Piracy and Other Maritime Offenses Act of 2019. This is the first case to be prosecuted under the law. Justice Faji has ordered an accelerated hearing. The Court of Appeal in Lagos has affirmed the judgment of the Sexual Offenses Court, which convicted and sentenced a Christian school supervisor, Adeboyega Adenakon, to 60 years imprisonment for defiling a two-year-old pupil. The presiding justice of the appeal court, Justice Lawal Garba, who read the lead judgment, held that the appeal filed by the convict lacked merit. 47-year-old Adenakon was convicted on one count of defilement of the pupil who attended Christian school, VGC, sometime in November 2016, by Justice Sibyl Nwaka, who held that the prosecution proved its case against the convict beyond every reasonable doubt. A magistrate court sitting in Zuba, Abuja, has dismissed the assault case instituted against Adama North lawmaker Senator Elisha Abo by the Nigeria Police Force. This is despite a viral video showing Abo assaulting a woman, Osimi Bibra Wamate, and a televised press conference in which the lawmaker apologized to the victim. Magistrate Abdullahi Ilela, who upheld a no-case submission filed by Abo, said the police failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the lawmaker assaulted the woman on May 11, 2019. And we round up with the report that the Court of Appeal sitting in Abuja has dismissed a suit filed by Dino Milai, a former lawmaker representing Kogi West Senatorial District, challenging the election of Smart Adeyemi. Justice Ibrahim Saulawa validated the ruling of the State National Assembly Election Petitions Tribunal, which upheld Adeyemi's victory. He also awarded 50,000 naira costs against Dino Milai and his party. And here's where we are adjourned till next week. Don't forget that you can watch again this episode of the program and past episodes on our YouTube channel. I'm Shola Sheeli. Thank you for watching. <laughs>